Hey other folks, we're all here. Uh, we're back with another episode of whatever this continues to not be called. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, perhaps possibly unmet expectations or even setting uh, incorrect expectations through through your gateway to Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop uh, role-playing games in general. But uh, I think I'd be remiss in saying that uh, Distal just funded yesterday. So this is a really weird uh, video to kind of shift to. I, I just want to acknowledge it. We did awesome things. The game is uh, it's going to be brought to your doorstep, I guess, uh, at some point in, in hardcover form, if that's what you you ended up backing. And, uh, and I'm super excited to just kind of like keep moving through this process. So thank you all uh, again. And, uh, and now for something different. So I just uh, finished my first run of Baldur's Gate 3. Um, I did a very complete playthrough. Like I, I looked up a guide on like making sure I hit all of the quests because I actually got two thirds of the way through the game and realized there was a lot I had missed in Act 1. Um, so can I pause you real quick? Yeah, this is an interesting um, paradigm because I don't like looking things up because um, I feel like it spoils things for me. Yeah. But are you are you the other on the other side of the spectrum where you don't yeah, want to miss so things? My m specifically in act three, um, because uh, first of all, this latest playthrough I did where I actually completed it, I downloaded the mod that takes away the party limit so you can have all of your party members at all times very much reduces the challenge of the game. But the reason I did that was because I got to act three and all of a sudden, Astarian... oh, a little spoilers, spoilers, just for oh, anybody yeah. who we, we didn't mention it up front. If oh, you haven't yeah, played yeah. through Baldur's Gate yet. Yeah. Yeah. There's the spoilers. So good. Yeah. It's probably right in the video title. That's the episode <laughs> yeah. name. Spoilers. spoilers <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, so I just, Astarian was mentioning parts of his backstory very suddenly uh, in act three. And I had no context for what he was talking about. And so I looked it up and it turns out there were like all these things in act one and two I had missed because he wasn't in my party when I interacted with certain NPCs. And really, I just felt like I was going to miss a whole lot of the story and a whole lot of what the community was celebrating. So that's why I felt like I had to look it up because Otherwise, you're you're getting like the third act of a story with no setup. So so it's I I was doing the whole like let things kind of unfold the way I would approach it as a player, but it, it ended up creating a very unsatisfactory experience uh, in the back half of the game. So I actually I I did like the first two acts the way that I think you would prefer, but then I, I realized I was gonna not have fun with the whole back third of the game or back half of the game. Just real, real quick, I remember you messaging me about like, uh, what's her name in Last Light? The, uh, the, the cleric. Oh, um, I want to say Luna and it's not, it's, it's, Isabel. it's not. <laughs> yeah. Isabel. It's, it's Isabel, yeah. right. Yeah, and I remember you saying like, is there any way to stop her from being like, like or like, is she always captured regardless? Yeah. And I'm like, no, dude, like, but let me know what happens if she <laughs> if she is and it's it's funny because i definitely wouldn't have broken the game with mods like that would be like a last resort before i've beaten the game because I, I want the experience that's intended by the designers because whenever you get like uh throw players uh into the mix and it's the same thing with gms like home brewing stuff before knowing all the rules you could break things that you didn't know that you were going to break until it it actually shows up uh, which can, you know, create a dissatisfying experience in, in different ways. Yeah, so I, I get through Baldur's Gate 3 and I reflect on the fact that it was like, it was a really good story. Like, the I felt like a lot of the choices mattered. Um, there were meaningful consequences to both things that you did and also um, checks that you could fail um, if you got low enough dice rolls. Coming out of it, it was interesting because, of course... My phone is spying on me, so I get a lot of Baldur's Gate content now because that's the thing I've been looking up and all that. Um, and a lot of videos I, I noticed kind of on my YouTube feed started to revolve around joke skits of players who were introduced to D&D &D through Baldur's Gate um, kind of 
like being disgruntled that 5e mechanics aren't quite what they experience in Baldur's Gate. So like a good example is in Baldur's Gate, jumping is a bonus action. Um, it's not just part of your movement as it is in 5th edition, and I like it better in Baldur's Gate, which is kind of the joke, but I, I started thinking not from a mechanics perspective, but I, I'm wondering what it's like for players who understand Baldur's Gate is D&D, it's their first experience, they may play through the whole campaign on their own, but then they come to a live table, does Baldur's Gate uh, set up healthy expectations or, you know, we talked before the recording about the Matt Mercer effect, which is a, a community term for Matt Mercer has such a distinct style and he's very successful um, entertaining people with his style that a lot of DMs try to copy it or players expect their DMs to have that style or that storytelling structure um, coming in. So I also wonder if because Baldur's Gate is like a solid product, does it give DMs good scaffolding to build off of? Like, hey, you know, don't copy the story beat for beat, but the general structure and the general tone, is it helpful for DMs to learn how to tell stories? Or does it have its own problems and does it set up harmful expectations that can actually stress out DMs instead of them relaxing into their own identity? So the the first thought that immediately comes to mind is like, how, how widespread is this effect? I know that we we talk about like the, the map, the map Mercer effect, man, I, I despise that name mm -hmm. uh, is, and I love Matt Mercer to, to be clear. And I also love his, his GMing style, but I realize that, that it is a, a style. So if you came into the hobby and that was the only thing that you're watching, or I understand that your expectations might be, might be different, but who did you sit down with at your first table? Um, is it you trying to be the GM or is it like you watch Critical Role um, and then you're, you're, that's the first GM that you're trying to emulate? Or are you sitting down at somebody else's table and then trying to, or and, and then they are doing something that you didn't expect? I think a lot of this, uh, if, if somebody else is the GM, a lot of this setting expectations happens at session zero. And this, of course, is a fairly new, uh, I don't want to say phenomenon, but like, uh, the, the term session zero was popularized within the the last, what, um, I wrote it down somewhere, but it's, it's like within the last decade, certainly. Mm -hmm. And uh, like it was loosely used back then, but more like formalized even in the past handful of years. Uh, so needing to, to set those baseline expectations is something that you're going to have to contend with as a GM regardless. Doesn't matter if your players are crazy. Doesn't matter if... Uh, you know, if, if you get along with, with everybody, if their experience is just a little bit different than what you expect to deliver, uh, or uh, on the, the other side of that, where you don't know the experience that they are that they want to have, that you want to give them, then you're going to have problems. It doesn't matter what your introduction to tabletop role-playing is. So, so I don't think that this, um, I don't really view it as an issue in in the way that is being like memed about and, and discussed about, at least not like a widespread issue. I feel like it's just normal human being issues that we need to resolve every, <laughs> every day. That's, so that's, that's my take though. Yeah. My, my reply to it is um, it, I just Googled it and yeah, there's like article after article. It's been officially reported on screen rant and comic book resources. Like it's definitely a, it's definitely a known thing like this sure but that's like cyclical some people yeah, um, yeah yeah but but like let's let's also realize at the same time that it's very difficult to find a measurable measurable impact of this because you like how many people are playing D, &D uh and just like happily doing that quietly and don't pay attention to social media don't pay attention to anything uh that would influence the the games that they already play so it's I guess generational in that sense that if you came through social media, you're more maybe in tune with like the memes that are being discussed. Yep. And also whenever there's, there's an issue like this, like, Oh, I remember vid seeing videos too, where it's just like Baldur's Gate sets incorrect expectations for people because of this, this, and this, and kind of like demonizing it in this way. The fact that it is a controversial uh, style of content is going to make it seem 
more of an issue than it actually is. Anything on social media, when you see like tabletop role playing community just have a, a big blowout because of drama that occurs at, at some point, the vast, vast majority of people aren't seeing that. But if you're like in tune, like if you're so TikTok, when you're watching that content, it's it's called a for you page for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Like you are already immersed in like admired in that discussion, uh, most likely, which is why it might seem more prominent than it actually is. So that's my so that's my diatribe on on that in particular. And there's no like good. I, I just wish that things were more quantifiable. Here's my question for you then. Um, so you mentioned uh, a very notable group, which is people who just quietly play TTRPGs and have been playing before social media. What do you think the fraction is of people who are playing TTRPGs before Critical Role was popular versus after Critical Role? I like, I feel like the okay. So it's impossible to say. Well, um, you is can, it though? You can, because you, you can, can track look at... how many people have bought books and exactly. bought products. Yeah. Right. So if you look at uh, um, the the history of the game over the last 50 years now, how many people are coming from earlier generations into to newer editions of, of Dungeons & Dragons? Like, yeah, you're going to pick up the, the new thing because it's new, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to like that being the first introductory experience of you as a GM. So that that would be my question. Like you can send out surveys too. And I'm pretty sure that Wizards has done it that at some point. Like what is your mm-hmm. earliest experience? Um, but even then, like a lot of those people, the old school players are not on D&D Beyond because that's right. not how they've been playing the game for the past however many, you know, decades. So in that respect, I think that it's it's very difficult to say. But but you're you're right that there there is some level of uh, quantifiability by virtue of of tracking the the books that are sold. Well, there it's that it's um, how mainstream D and D has gotten. Um, every major industry, um, like professional, like including um, you know influencers like Jenny D and. Um, XP to level three, uh, as well as, you know, we both listen to the Ghostfire podcast, um, who are uh, publishers in the field. They credit Critical Role and Stranger Things as like the industry blowing up and creating this golden renaissance age for TTRPGs. I think that Critical Role really was one of, if not the linchpin of, and I mean, they have their own animated show now, like the the size of that property and the size of that franchise has just exploded over the past few years. So just general reach, they were the number one show on Twitch for a really long time before they did their own service. I have a hard time believing that the number of people who are playing D&D because uh, they watched Critical Role is not significantly larger than people who have been playing over the past 50 years. I I think that they make uh, people who have been playing TTRPGs um before critical role that i feel like that might be like maybe 10 percent of the total people who are playing now because of social media and because okay. they it's been demystified if anybody has any links to to articles uh well don't post them in the comments because it'll turn out as, as spam but feel free yeah. to like like tell us where to to find those because there has to have been some quantifiable information somebody's done the, the deep dive for sure I guess my argument at that point is like, okay, let's say that everybody came into the hobby through critical role Mm -hmm. uh, or just a significant portion, like you mentioned. How many of those people, uh, given that they would, you know, they're they're online, they're looking at uh, D&D-based content. Uh, Ginny D is the number one uh, uh, YouTuber for D&D bar none. And she also offers a lot of advice that sets people on the right track as far as you know becoming a better dm becoming a better player playing the the game and there are many 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 sources out there like that that are also there that they're effectively altering that perception of the matt mercer effect by giving people the reality um, of it so i think that you can't just have one and say like okay these are the expectations because really it's a boiling pot of all sorts of expectations because if you're on you know if you're looking at at media regarding uh D&D you're you're seeing all sides of it it's not just the just the one thing 
Yeah. So to go back to something you said earlier, um, I agree that I really don't like the name of it. Um, Matt Mercer has come out and said, I've heard of this, you know, not necessarily commenting on the name, but please find your own GMing style. Don't right. try to copy me. Um, and one of the reasons I say it's so prevalent is I've had personal experiences, both as a player with a GM trying to copy that style to uh, not great effect, as well as players who have given me feedback that was basically like, it wasn't critical role and that's really what I'm looking for. So when it comes to setting expectations, I, I do know that in, in general, again, this is anecdotal. I, I don't have surveys or whatever, but um, the, the critical role community tends to be very passionate and what they want is what they want. I do think a lot of that can be countered with a session zero um, and setting expectations. And sometimes there there is an element of no matter what you do as the GM, your players are going to have certain expectations or certain preferences or a way that they like the game to be played. So I, I've seen plenty of people talk about the fact that they they actually went the other direction where they got into Baldur's Gate because uh, they they liked D and D yep. and, and hadn't played a, a game like that. So it kind of goes, goes both ways there too. I, I think that the, uh, the set expectations discussion is a really difficult one to have because it's, because you don't know how, how prevalent it is, but I think we already have the solution. It's like, you know, do your session zero, be a good GM, do a session zero. Uh, when it comes to the, um, just how dissatisfying it was, to move into the other uh, third chapter of, uh, of Baldur's Gate. Uh, Without having all my party members. Right. So I'm having a hard time just imagining how that actually works because there's so many different, man, that's a gaggle of people um, walking around the map. That seems insane um, so, to me. So, yeah, to come back, you made a comment about not playing the game as the designers intended. Mm. And also, I, I do, I, and I, I, this is just a question. It's not like a statement. It's just... I wonder if if Larian like would have let that mod be a thing if they had the time and processing power for it because that mod is like processing intensive like because you have so many characters on the screen all animating and so many people in the turn order like if you don't have a powerful enough machine um it can definitely like just lock up <laughs> because there's so much going on so I I'm not sure the party limit thing is necessarily like a design intent thing. I wonder how much of it is like what what are most people's machines capable of? Um, and if you you mm. are designing a commercial product, it does it's it's the same uh, problem that D and D was running into with their VTT. There was that funny interaction where they were showing off all the awesome graphics, and one of the uh, people in attendance of the demonstration said, hey, you're running that on an Alienware. Uh, can this run on lower specs? And they're like, oh, is that a thing we should consider? It's like, yes, D&D, &D, <laughs> that is a thing that we should consider. Oh, man. So, yeah. so that's where like, I actually was more satisfied with the story that I was able to absorb and the choices I was able to make by having everybody than I was when it was limited to only four party members I was trying to cycle out at the right time. Okay, so that's crazy to me because uh, who gets to talk? Everybody. <laughs> okay, so that doesn't make sense. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah, so there's this weird like paradigm where we, we've all done this. Uh, maybe not you, uh, given that you have all the party members there, but where you go back to, like you know that a uh, interaction, an important interaction is going to happen. So then you go to camp, you pick up the party member, and then you come back. And then have like talk to the dude, and then it'll it'll trigger an interaction. Um, so, for example, when you're in uh, the uh, sh shadow lands, yeah, what is it called? Oh, it is Shadowlands. Yeah. Um, and you're you're going to uh, and to that that crypt. It's a it's a Temple of Shar, and uh, and Raphael's outside. You and if you don't have a Starian with you then he's going to complain about it in camp that he said like he'll he'll confront you about Raphael and like needing to to talk to him but i'm pretty sure like you don't need that interaction to happen right there in order to 
to push the story forward because Larian specifically made it so that if you have if you talk to Raphael and he'll he'll bring up Astarian, Astarian is going to confront you when you go when you go back to camp. So I think in that respect, uh, just when you're designing this game, yeah, it, you need to account for those sorts of situations. I don't think that it that they would have ever wanted you to bring an entire party uh, with you because I don't I don't think that their past games worked like that. And it's also, it's just, it's tighter. You can have more like um, intimate character interactions and conversations when there are fewer people on the screen. Same thing at a D&D table. If you have nine different people there, you have to figure out who's going to talk. And then you have to make sure not to talk too much. I think that it would have been intended to have a smaller group regardless. That being said, earlier Baldur's Gates, um, Neverwinter in particular, I think you did like have like nine people roaming around. Um, and it was it was isometric, so the same as um, as Baldur's Gate is now, uh, unless you zoom in the camera. But uh, but they're also like really small on screen, and the game was more. I think that that genre has sort of evolved toward like less mass combat style mechanics and more toward intimate storytelling mechanics. So I think that this is the intended way to to play, um, not with the mass party, but with the small one. So my question is, first of all. Baldur's Gate 3 is the first Larian game I've played. I haven't mm. played Divinity or anything else, so I can't comment on their past style as much as you can. Um, what, what I can say is I have I did not get the same intimate thing. It just felt like a mm. middle step to save processing power. And basically what would happen is, to use your example of, of the Char mausoleum, I just showed up and Astarian was like, oh, hey, Raphael. And then you'd get a few quips from other party members like Carlax, like, I don't trust that guy. And Will was like, oh, man, I have a thing with the devil, blah, blah, blah. So like you'd get these these like character insights, um, which you don't have to interpret literally as them talking. You can just think of it as that's them thinking. But it just created such richer scenes because now it wasn't i have to go back and now i have to go this way and it just all of it was resolved right there and it, it made it a lot more immediate so this is something we definitely disagree about but i think it's worth mentioning um during uh the pandemic when we were all playing online one of the things that my group really struggled with was technical limitations um as in a lot of players did not have updated equipment uh, they were trying to do a Zoom meeting or a Discord thing, caused a lot of lagging out. And basically gameplay was like just trying to hear what each other was saying. So we adopted this style where if we had a VTT, we would uh, type all the gameplay in chat so that, first of all, it was quicker and it wouldn't lag out. But also one of the side effects we found is that players could chime in. So that if, you know, you've got a four person party, all four people can participate, even if one of them is being spotlighted. Um, and that was impossible to do at a live table. So I, I distinctly remember being at a live table and one player was having a character moment with an NPC. And it was obvious it was part of their backstory. It was some cathartic thing for the player. And another player was like, he asked everyone to stop. And it was like, my character has his arms folded and is leaning back against a wall, which it ruined the flow. It definitely took away. It was obvious this other player was being disruptive, but a similar thing happened in this typing format. And what it did was it just like set the scene better. It, it didn't interrupt because nobody was being interrupted while talking. It was just part of this text back and forth, a lot like Baldur's Gate's uh, combat log. So I found that my favorite sessions I've ever run were like eight, nine person sessions in that typing format because oh. it was like an Avengers like coming together where everyone gets to bounce off of each other and form unique friendships. Um, it was very cool. So we didn't talk about um, kind of how the how the game is actually set up. Larry has done some some masterful story writing. I don't know we can we can talk about some of the decisions that you uh, you get to make in that game because it's. There's a lot to glean when you're you're trying to write uh, a campaign of your own. One of the biggest lessons that I gleaned as like a storytelling game master um, was just, again, how strong the setup and initial drive is. So 
again, spoilers for the game, but the immediate thing that happens to your character is they get infected with a Mind Flayer tadpole. But for some reason, the process of transforming into a Mind Flayer is blocked. So a lot of your character's personal goals revolve around trying to get the tadpole out of your head or choosing to learn how to control it or just learning the mysteries of why you haven't transformed when you're supposed to. I think that setting a strong initial motivator is really powerful and helps players stay on board longer. In order to get players invested, it's easiest to start with uh, with things that matter to the, the player. Um, if I told you that, yeah, your character is going to die, and but we know that there is you know, a solution out there somewhere. You'd be like, okay, well, I'm, I'm interested in not dying. Uh, my character not dying. And, and that's like where you start. So you, um, begin small. I, I guess it's an e- egocentric motivator. You become more attached to the world by just by virtue of spending time in it. So just like if you're like new on the job, like your first day of job, first, first day of job, your first day of work. And then by virtue of going to work every day, you're going to meet people. I mean, lots of working from home, uh, talking, uh, to people like understanding how the the management dynamics work, um, understanding who the big bad is uh, at the company, maybe, and that's just by being there. So start small, expand outward. That's one of the things that um, this campaign setup does really, really well. The other thing is that they they immerse you in a uh, a point of action right from the start. So instead of starting in a tavern, you you got a time limit. You know the ship is about to crash. You need to, to find a way out of it. So it's it gives you that start and end goal and uh, allows you to feel out your character. And you're immediately making decisions on kind of who you want with you based on your your party composition. And I think that's something that you, you miss too if you're um, if you're running that, that particular mod is that uh, there's less decision making uh, involved. So I do want to say I did play most of the game with four right. players. Like, it's not like I only did the mod again. All right. So so spoilers on missions. I completed the Steel Watch Factory, the Iron Throne quest. Like I was pretty much on Orin and Gortash. But the problem was that I was about to do um, like this Astarian mission with Kazador, And I had no context for who this character was. Mm. And Astarian asked me to go to deal with his backstory, but because I had left him in camp, I I didn't have, and it didn't feel organic or right for my character. Why would my character have zero interaction with Astarian just because I wasn't allowed to have him in my party because of a party limit size? Um, and, mm. and why should I know to bring him along to see Raphael at, at the uh, mausoleum? Like it just, it, it felt like, I had missed a lot of stuff, but not because I had made the choice to miss it, but because it mm. was hidden enough that I, I didn't know I was making a decision. Yeah, you know, it's this is this is kind of an issue with these um, these types of games in general. Have, have you played like Mass Effect or uh, Dragon Age? I have not. Okay, so in these games, uh, you you go on a mission, and then you you go to you know back to your ship or uh, back to your camp or fortress or whatever and then really you should go around and talk to every party member because they will have something to say and sometimes talk to them twice just, just to make sure you, you catch up on their story beats super obnoxious especially and it's even more obnoxious i'd say in in Baldur's gate because so when i play through the game i don't need to rest nearly as often as i need to rest for uh for story purposes I like I almost lost a relationship with Carlac just because I moved from Act Two to Act Three, and she's like, "Ah, oh, yeah, the, the sparks like kind of fizzled, didn't they?" I'm like, "What? No, I don't want that. I don't want like I have to go back, you know, however many hours just to to go like do the whole Moonrise um, Towers uh, again because I didn't like sleep, talk to Carlac, sleep, um, have some random other story beat, sleep, do another story beat." Um, just so that I can get to the the interesting part of that car like relationship so that it will perpetuate into Act 3. Um, actually, Ginny D posted a tweet when she was like, like, well, I guess I, I don't get a relationship. I think it was with Carlac. Um, and and I was like, 
let's see, this is what I'm talking about. It's like, you can't structure games like this. So this is definitely one of the cons of having that, that sort of interaction because they, they can only show you so many scenes during downtime and they have a priority list that they'll work through. Uh, Hades works similarly where um, the dialogue is prioritized. So it's like, if you've, uh, if you haven't yet seen this, this uh, piece of dialogue, you need to see it first uh, when you inter interact with a certain god. Um, and a lot of games work like that because it is, it's a very intelligent way to, uh, to catch anything that you may have missed. Like instead of doing, I mean, you're still doing plenty of like what are essentially branching if then else sort of statements. It's, it's more like, it's more like requirements. Like have, have they done this? Have they done this? Have they done this? Okay, cool. Then, you know, they get access to this, but, uh, but it's, it's really, it's really difficult to, to know that as a new player to these types of games that like, no, you need to actually like go back to camp, you know, and especially since there's like conflicting interests too. Like you don't want to do that because there's a tadpole parasite in your head. So you're like trying to stretch out those moments and spend as much time on the field without resting as you can. So there, there's like clashing uh, objectives and that part is, is super frustrating too. One of the reasons why I felt like I had to do a checklist on basically my second run because I just didn't complete my first one um, is because it felt like there were a lot of false choices um, mm. in that uh, one of the things that happens toward the end of Act One is Halson is like, all right, so we can either go the mountain pass or we can go through the Underdark. And in my run, my romance was with Shadowheart and I knew that the Underdark was going to make her happy. So I said, we'll go to the Underdark and she approved. Turns out you can also go to the mountain pass and do all of Lazel's quest line and then just decide to go to the Underdark after. But the way that the game set my expectation was that there was one or the other. And I decided to go the one that I thought was supposed to do it. Um, I also missed the my first run. I missed completely the Auntie Ethel quest line. I just mm. didn't happen to talk to her. And it turns out the way to get to the Putrid Swamp is you have to go through the Blighted Village down this like little hidden path to the side. And I just completely, I missed like this very intriguing side plot because I, I just didn't know. Um, so, but th there are a few times through the game that it has these kind of like false sense of rushing or it feels like one path should be closed off by doing another the other one was uh was Orin when she kidnaps a party member. Basically, there is there is one point where I started to betray her, and it turns out you can like long rest like two or three times, and your party member will just be chilling down there, unharmed. Um, huh. which is funny because in the Underdark, you know, with Nier, if you don't rescue him and you take a long rest, he gets poisoned in the thing and dies. So right. Hey, did you know that there's a dragon that you fight in the game? Uh. Kind of. <laughs> Sorry, did you know that there's two dragons that you fight in the game? Yeah, it's a loose definition of the term dragon. <laughs> okay, well, point being, I didn't do any of that. Um, I didn't do uh, a bunch of stuff with Min Minsk. Uh, the first time that I played through, uh, Jahara died, so I didn't see any of uh, J or, sorry, Jahira. Um, uh, she died in the in the assault on uh, on the tower. And that was actually because I did like a long rest because they they like were like, yeah, we're, we're going to do it. And then <laughs> they long rested uh, and then I came back. Everybody's dead. And it's yeah, there, I think there's a little bit of inconsistency there for sure. But at the same time, you should kind of be OK with that. And I know that some people aren't like that's the, that's the point of creating a game as expansive as this is that first off, it requires exploration for the people who are interested in exploration. Second is that it creates replayability so that you go through and your choices become different based on who you bring, based on uh, what sorts of things you do or don't do. Yeah, like I've seen a playthrough without Shadowheart. Um, I've seen a playthrough with uh, with Lazelle very much not redeemed. Um, she, she leans real hard into uh, you know saving her or rather like serving the queen. So like that's actually one of those things where if you don't do the mountain pass, it's a good thing because you get to see this other side of your characters. Uh, you get to see what would happen if you if you didn't do all the things. 
and that to me is really interesting and i i feel like it it might be dissatisfying for, for some people such as yourself where you you want like all the good stuff all the time but i i, I mean sorry I'm, I'm not trying to like mischaracterize that but based on what you're saying it seems like you're well you're hoping for yeah go ahead. It's, it's not necessarily the good stuff as much as um there is also kind of a logic to it like why would these other characters like let's say i left a star in in camp why would he be satisfied waiting around in camp with a tadpole in his head ready to eat him mm -hmm. versus being an active participant in trying to solve the problem that would be motivating him uh, probably because you you told him that you would though right right but why would he trust me i don't know like that like the whole idea of I have these characters waiting in camp, not participating, just seems out of character for all mm. of those characters, even if they do end up trusting me like that. That's more yeah. like so there's the there's the difficulty of combat. Um, but to me, I, I was just more interested in learning who these characters are story wise, which is why I wanted them all with me. Um, so to just not have a lot of them and not. I don't want to play this game over and over again. Like I actually, it was interesting when I finally finished it and I got the credits roll, I was like relieved because mm. I, I, it was so hard to just close loops. Um, I would go into it thinking I'd play for an hour and then three and a half hours went by, but it wasn't because I was engaged. It was because I was trying to talk to everybody so I could turn it off. And then mm. it would lead to like five more scenes that I'd have to sit through before I could just end the day like it was to me it was it was too much in terms of how expansive it was interesting um yeah I could totally see that because I, I say I have those feelings too but the I think the difference between you and I is that I have experience with this type of game in the past and I kind of like know where where those breakpoints should be and I mean you can you can save in the middle of a cutscene and then just just pick it up after that Oh, don't I know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, that, that took me a little little while to figure out. Did here, quick question. Did you um become a mind flayer? Nope. I made Orpheus do that. See? I think that makes you a bad person, personally. So I didn't make him. The dialogue option was I'm not gonna be a mind flayer. I'm gonna just try to tank it. And Orpheus was like, fine, I'll be a mind flayer. And there wasn't an option to stop him. He just kind of did it. So yeah. I felt morally, um, I don't know what the word is, <laughs> morally secure, but also. Okay, so dude has been imprisoned for, uh, it was, I think it was like thousands of years, right? And this is his powers is to protect you from the mind flayer. And that's very important. He says that uh, that one of us, like because of how powerful the end boss became, the, became another brain. Like it's too late to to just rely on my power. Like one of us needs to become uh, a mind flare. And he he says that you know for for his people he will he will do it. And then you you can say like basically like you know no you need to lead your people and. Um, and then, like you know, you take on you you ruin your character. You turn it into a to a mind flare. And then, uh, yeah, as it turns out, um, even if you have a romance with Lazelle, she's like, "Listen, tentacles, I can't do it." And then she gets on the dragon and flies away. She doesn't say exactly that thing, but that's how it feels. And then you're just a sad, dying squid boy, uh, and, and that's it. But it's it's interesting that I got to experience that and it made me want to play again to to see how things shake out. That's not for everybody because it is a significant time investment to get to that point. And I think that's where where a lot of people um where it turns a lot of people off. Like I'm still stuck on Gortash uh, on my second my Dark Urge playthrough because I specifically and very stubbornly want to kill him the first time that I meet him. Uh, I don't need to do that. I can just continue playing the game, but I haven't seen what happens if you do that. So I'm like, that is the thing that I want to do. And, and that's the line that I, I draw. So I think it, it all really just comes down to we all want different things out of our games. Yeah. And I, I guess that was my point with bringing up the topic to begin with is trying to figure out 
like more open the possibilities that there are multiple ways to play because I have, like I mentioned earlier, I've played with GMs where they're like, this is the way to play. And then they end up with no players and unhappy um, because they find themselves unable to listen to the specific things their players are excited about and, you know, learn how to integrate them. And I'm not even saying those GMs should abandon what they like to do but also just be open to the fact that there might be moments or scenes or sessions where if they approached it with a slightly different angle, everybody would be happier, including themselves. I think the danger of whether it's Critical Role or or Baldur's Gate is, is just enjoying yourself so much that that's the only thing you could enjoy. Whereas like you mentioned, there are multiple ways to play even this game. Um, and multiple different benefits you get and also drawbacks. So, um, you know, we have a, we have a mutual friend who's a GM and he's been messaging me on his playthrough. He also downloaded the, the unlimited party mod, but he limited himself to five characters instead of four because he was dissatisfied with how easy combat was with, you know, 10, 11 fully built level 11 characters. It's, it's not super challenging. Um, but to me, I, I wasn't interested in the combat mechanics because I've played plenty of D and D before. I don't, that's not the part that interests me. It's the, it was the story that became possible when everybody was able to bounce off of each other. Um, and there were like a lot of scenes. I realized that if Jahira is in your party in act three, there's a lot of scenes that you get to see and a lot of interactions that are impossible if she died at Moonrise or if she's stuck in your camp, like in my first playthrough. So it just, it gave me the freedom to kind of make sure that all the options were available as opposed to not realizing I missed an option by not having it available. Um, But yeah, multiple ways to play the game, I think is the ultimate thesis here. Thank you all for, uh, Taking a look at our, our, our podcast. We'll, we'll catch you next week with another episode. Uh, if you have any topic ideas, feel free to send those in. If you want to call this podcast by some name, feel free to do that. We don't know what it is yet. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.